Hello, everybody, now that you can see me. Um, it's really good to be together with you this morning, and kind of like Lori alluded, I have begun to realize that I can imagine seeing all of your smiling faces as I look into that camera, and I really do feel like we are all together uh, in his presence. And so this is going to be, I believe, an extraordinary uh, morning. Uh, the Lord has been sharing some things with me that were at times amusing and kind of caught me off guard. And um, so we have a theme for this, but as we prepare for our morning offering, I really felt led to share an experience that I had. And today is really about encountering the Lord, of, of tasting and seeing that he is genuinely good. And uh, I remembered having an experience at Bethel Church, going into their prayer room at the very beginning of a... Uh, um, a leadership conference that they were hosting there and as I walked into the prayer room I was just going to quiet myself and wait on the Lord a little bit and it was one of those unusual times I actually had an encounter with him and I heard him ask very clearly a, a specific question of me he asked why is it most of the time that you spend with me is transactional and not relational and it went right to the core of my being. I would spend time with the Lord in worship, in prayer, studying his word, often to get a message to be able to preach or to prepare for a missions trip or to prepare for a meeting or to uh, get some outcome from my time with him. And so it was really just a matter of me doing a transaction. I'm going to give you my time and I need you to give me that. And as I walked into that prayer room, I realized he was calling me to something different, not just a transaction, but an actual deeper relationship. He wanted to be a friend of mine. He wanted to spend time with me. He wanted to laugh with me. He wanted me to share who I was with him because he enjoyed um, our time together. And so, you know, I as we take an offering, it's not just a transaction. We're not just giving uh, of our resources to the Lord or to the kingdom, but it's actually an expression of, of ourselves, of our security, of our appreciation, even of our thankfulness. So uh, I just, I want to just pray real quick for our service and pray for uh, an offering, but I encourage you even this morning, don't think of the giving that you may do online or the giving you may do by sending in a check here or by texting, don't think of it as a transaction. Think of it as an expression of, Lord, I, I love you. I want more of you in my life. I want more of you in the lives of other people that I know. So I'm invested. I'm invested emotionally. I'm invested financially. I'm invested with my whole heart to letting the Lord be the Lord of my life and to letting him become the Lord of others' lives as well. So, Father, we thank you today for the opportunity that you give us to give from that which you have given to us. Lord, you give us 90%. What kind of a, an investor are you that you're willing to give 90% and all you ask is for 10% back for, the, for our hearts to be really connected to your kingdom, to your ways on earth, your values in this culture, Lord, for supporting one another, and people within our community. So we thank you for the honor, the opportunity. Everything you created gives. Sun uh, gives light and warmth, and uh, plants give oxygen, Lord. And we just thank you so much that giving comes right from your very heart. So receive this offering. And now I pray you bless our time together, bless this service, everything that you were sharing with me, um, I pray, Holy Spirit, that these just won't be words, they won't be just fun stories, but we want to be transformed. We want to be more like you at the end of this time together than we were when we started. And we thank you because you do it by your spirit. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. So where I wanted to start, actually, in an unusual way, I, I do this purposefully I am obsessed now in this season of my life with keeping people focused on staying connected with the Lord, of understanding the relational nature, just like the Lord told me years ago, of daily, moment by moment even, acknowledging his presence, responding to his promptings, listening attentively. And so I want to encourage you 
um, to have a devotional life, get into his word and look for his spirit to breathe on the pages of his written objective word to have it become what you believe as well. Because it's not just what you know that changes you, but it's what you believe in your heart that begins to affect what you do. But I also want to encourage you to be a listener, be an active listener to the Lord. Um, be slow to speak and quick to hear, as James says. And so this morning in my journaling, he said something that really um, uh, captured my imagination a little bit, but also spoke to a personal area in my life. And I just want to share it because I love when you share things you're hearing from the Lord with me as well. It's fine for us to give people our ideas and our opinions and our perspective on things, but honestly, when you learn to listen and you learn to discern when is it a prompting from the Holy Spirit, then when you share it with other people, he anoints those words because they came from him. They go deep into another person's spirit and plant seeds that they may not even be aware of. And so uh, Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuit order, uh, taught one time when the Holy Spirit does something it's like a drop of water on a sponge so the water hits the sponge and the sponge absorbs and expands it increases to receive that potential that is in that water when a spirit other than god does something it's like a drop of water on a rock there's just a thud and the water runs off and there's no benefit there's no growth there's no germination from it which by the way is a very very good test um, when Lori and I got together with our guest speaker two weeks ago, John Carney, uh, we were able to share a meal together. And some of the things that John said just went so deep. He, he was humble. He didn't say, thus saith the Lord. He didn't presume anything, but he spoke by the Spirit in a way that Lori and I have had several conversations afterward because I felt the increase of some of the things he shared. It began to expand in my heart. So, uh, I want to share from my own personal relationship this morning with the hope that uh, the Holy Spirit will expand this in your heart as well. He said, remember, my joy is your strength. Joy actually increases my presence. Why do you think people are so attracted to it? They love to be with me, whether they know it's me or not. Joy actually increases God's experience, uh, people's experience of God's presence because joy is the nature of God. Overwhelming gratitude and thankfulness is a heart that understands not just what they've received, but who. <laughs> That's really good. And so I, I was thinking about why, for some reason, I, I rate most of my life experiences based on how good a laugh I got and uh, some people over the years have thought that that's a superficial quality. But to be honest, that was the context of what the Lord and I were talking about, how much he loves my laugh, how much uh, I've heard him laugh, and what that does for me. And so I just release joy right now over everyone who's listening. I just ask for laughter to come and be medicine deep inside of all of us, to just restore hope, to restore life, and so uh, it just, it, it really touched me what, what he shared this morning. And uh, Lori mentioned we've started the uh, School of Ministry class this last Tuesday at 7. And it was incredible. It was our first time of doing a Skype class. There were 16 faces right up there on the screen. And we were able to watch the video together and then interact together. And actually, I didn't have to imagine seeing you. I could actually see you. And, and discuss the video and pray together and pray for each other and worship together. It was uh, an extraordinary experience. And honestly, the heart of this message, it's called the hope of the world, came out of just uh, an aphoristic saying that Bill shared um, in the class. It wasn't even the primary focus of it. But again, I believe the Spirit was breathing on it for me. It went very deep inside of me. He said, Jesus' return is the hope of the church. But the gospel is the hope of the world. And, and I just had to pause for a moment. Like so often when Bill says something, it's like, stop the tape. I've got to absorb that for a moment. Let that go where it needs to go so I can respond the way that I'm supposed to. And so I've been praying around that a little bit. And, uh, and I really wondered, what, what does that mean that Jesus' return is the hope of the church? 
And first off, I think we need to bring a context. I'm not talking church in terms of an institution, church in terms of uh, a service, uh, even uh, church is a, a gathering of all true believers in the many, many different ways they gather. So um, church is all true believers doing whatever believers do when they believe. So if you are loved by God, you want to begin to express that love to those in your life and those in your community. And when you are manifesting that love, you are the church. You are doing church. You are being the church. And, I, and some of this may sound cliche to many of you, but for those who are in that union, that relationship, that give and take, listening and pouring your heart out, being restored, renewed, refreshed, transformed by the word of God, um, when you're in that place, then you are the church. And, and I, I, I even still, I, I have my, because I've done church life for so long, I still think in terms of church leadership, church discipline, church gatherings. I have spoken poorly sometimes of the church. I've talked about toxic church or institutional church. And you know what I have to continue to remember and remind myself of? I want to honor the presence of God expressed to the world through sons and daughters who are living and walking with him, manifesting the love and the kingdom and the service and the joy of God to all of those around them. If you remove from the world the sanctifying presence of everyone who truly loves God, we'd be living in Biff's world. What kind of a disastrous uh, Biff's world from back to the future? Yeah, it'd be a dark, dark place. But God manifests his love in us and then through us, and by that, the world is transformed. So we should speak of the church with uh, reverence, with joy. The church is his bride, the object of his affections. Whew. Oh. And you know, when you talk badly about a bride, you wind up getting a very upset groom. And I don't want to upset the groom. I want to partner with him in how he sees what he's doing on the earth through those who are genuine believers who aren't just talking the talk but are actually walking it out. That's what we're talking about when we say that Jesus' return is the hope of the church, of all genuine believers who are encountering his presence. 1 John 2, 3 through 3 says, Beloved, so obviously talking to those that are beloved by God, known by God, who know God, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, when Jesus returns, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. Ho, oh, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. We know Jesus is going to return. If you have been born again, converted, you now are seeing the world through his perspective, your greatest joy won't just be going to heaven, although that's inconceivable in many levels. Your joy should be Jesus come and return now as the triumphant, loving conqueror of evil. Reveal yourself in majesty, in love and truth for who you really are. And let all of the world now come into alignment, into obedience with the radiance of your love. Jesus is the exact representation, by the way, of the Father. The Father has always so loved the world that he did send his Son. And what is the ultimate for the church expression, really, of maturity? It's being like him. It's Christ-likeness. There are discipleship programs that are wonderful all over the world, many, many different languages, but the reality is if it's dis becoming a disciple of Jesus, then that means you're becoming like him in the things that you do, the things that you say, the things that you think, the things that you believe. You're being transformed from the inside out and coming into the fullness of the stature of the person of Jesus. 
and knowing what his will is and longing to see that goodness of his will expressed through your life. Wow, it's so powerful. Becoming the likeness of Jesus. And that's what this verse is talking about. We shall be like him and we're going to see him as he is. Bill Johnson again says that when Jesus is clearly revealed, people are drawn to him. And when Jesus, when, uh, Jesus the, the expression of Jesus is distorted, then people are repelled. And I fundamentally, I do believe that's true. When people see Jesus for who he is, most people want to argue about God, they want to argue about doctrine, they want to argue about different things, but the majority of people who are even children of God and believers and people who don't even know God have a very hard time arguing with the life of Jesus, the stories of Jesus, the uh, words and deeds of Jesus. Almost every religion has to acknowledge the genuineness of the expression of love and truth that Jesus actually is. And so I was thinking about it, you know, when Jesus is clearly revealed, when people, people know it when they see it. People know faith when they see it. When somebody is believing something, holding on to something with faith, when it doesn't make sense yet, it hasn't materialized yet, it isn't even the reality of what you can observe yet, but they believe that their child is going to become a loving, world-changing uh, revivalist to their generation. When they believe that their community can show compassion for those that are in need. When they believe that serving widows and orphans makes an eternal difference and they act upon those beliefs. People know it when they see it and they honor lives that are lived by faith. Like Abraham, our father of faith, stepping out with a promise alone that was so impossible. But you know, for people who know Jesus, who are walking with Jesus, the impossible begins to seem rational because Jesus lived a miraculous life and he calls, calls us to that same miraculous life. So people know faith when they see it. People know the ways and the values of the kingdom of God when they see it. They know when people treat each other with honor, with dignity, with respect, with loving kindness. They know when they see people serving each other in a way that is building up those that are at risk in our community and in our neighborhoods. They know they've observed something of the kingdom. They know when a person afflicted by illness is supernaturally healed, they've just had a collision of heaven on earth with the kingdom of God. They know they've observed something different than what happens in the natural. They know when they see somebody who's been tormented, even by demonic activity, evil thoughts that they just can't get away, call it paranoia, call it a psychological disorder, but sometimes it is rooted spiritually in an evil force that is oppressing a person, and that person can get instantaneous breakthrough, all of a sudden have a joy they didn't know, a hope for their future that they have never had. That is a as an encounter with the kingdom of God. But also, people know the person of Jesus when they see him. They know when they see the life of Jesus resting on another person. And just like the Lord was talking to me about uh, today, that his joy is actually our strength, and joy actually increases his presence. Um, I, I think sometimes about the weddings I've done over the years, and... Uh, it doesn't happen every time. Um, I want it to happen more, but there have been times, especially when I, I've done weddings of 100, 150 people. Many, 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 many people didn't really know the Lord, but a wedding is such a beautiful expression of Christ and the church, Christ and his bride. It expresses that unconditional love, that commitment for the well-being and welfare of the other that is permanent that when you handle it that way, the Holy Spirit can so rest on aspects of that beautiful ceremony that I have seen people moved to tears and not know why. They've had joy erupting in their heart or they've had a deep sense of peace and well-being. And after the wedding, I've had the honor to walk through and talk to different people who are absolutely confused. What was that? What I haven't felt 
peace like that since I was a child. And to be able to say to them, that is what it's like when you experience the presence of God. Because in his presence is the fullness of joy. In his presence is peace and well-being. Isn't it wonderful? Don't you want to know him more? We carry, as true believers, that presence with us that we come uh, into the different experiences that we have in our world. So it's not just acting by faith. It's not just learning to demonstrate the ways and the values of the kingdom. It's actually learning the likeness and living the life that Jesus lived while he was here, which he empowers us to do on a daily basis. Oh, the other reason that the return of Jesus is the hope of the church, and I hope it is your hope. Uh, Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name on earth. I put in the on earth part. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Someday, when Jesus is clearly revealed, the radiance of his love and truth and joy whether you knew him or not, when you see it, you know it. And every tongue, every knee is going to bend. No pride, no arrogance, no self-sufficiency can stand before the ultimate expression of who God is. And every tongue will be able to actually confess him for who he is. That, hmm, ah, I, I don't want that to be a cliche verse. I don't want that to be an old thought for myself or for anyone else. I want to look forward to that moment with anticipation, knowing that when that comes, I'm also going to be transformed into his likeness, into his image. And by the way, when I look forward to that, 1 John 2, 3 says that I actually purify myself. I actually, when I begin to think he's going to come back, every tongue's going to confess, he's going to be recognized as Lord of all the earth, and I want to be there. I want to be like him. The, the unique Charlie expression of who Jesus is in me and the unique expression of who Jesus is in you, I am so looking forward. I, maybe I'm looking more forward to that than heaven itself although the two are virtually synonymous. When his kingdom is on earth, we are encountering heaven here on earth. Ho! Oh, and every good purpose of his heart is going to be manifest toward all of us. So we have that as his children to look forward to, and I encourage you to reflect on that. Think about that, because what it does is it makes you desire to be more and more and more like him, to do the things that he does, to say the things that he says, just like Jesus' greatest joy in the world was doing everything he saw the Father doing, everything he heard the Father saying, and then that's our model to follow after him in that same example. And we have the story in stereo of his life in the Gospels to know how he always seemed to respond in an unexpected, extravagant way to the circumstances before him. So that's what Jesus' return, being the hope of the church, has begun to mean to me. But the gospel, being the hope of the world, is something entirely different. And uh, there are many ways to phrase it. So the phrase that I have for today is the gospel itself, is through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, we have been reconciled to the love of an extravagant father that we couldn't have really known or fully known without him. We could try to backpack our way to heaven. We could try to perform many, many good works. We could try to be better than other people. We could occasionally sin and say, I'm sorry, and think that it's all taken care of, and maybe God will, will love us. But without the reconciliation that Jesus brings into our lives through that extravagant price that he paid that we could be forgiven. God doesn't have to ignore our sin any longer. Our sin has been taken care of. And now we can be fully 
in his presence, come boldly into his presence as sons and daughters. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.18 says that Jesus came to reconcile the world back to the Father. And by the way, that he has given us as his church that ministry of reconciliation. And yes, it is progressive. There have been degrees in my walk, in my friendship with the Lord, where I've continued to understand the kind of son that I am, the kind of father that he is, my ability to not just intellectually understand, but to believe deep in my heart and to allow that transformative work to begin to express itself more and more through me. So in the class, God is good. Um, the anchor verse that Bill talked about was um, Psalms 34, 4. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. If you know he's good, you can come to him anytime with any need, with any crisis, COVID-19, divorce, death of a loved one, a child who's making terrible decisions that are causing pain and loss in their lives and the lives of others. You can take all of those and run to God as a refuge, as a stronghold, as a safe place with your broken heart. Because God is close to the broken hearted and you say, God, I know that you're good and this feels like a disaster. God, do something with this because I've tasted, I've experienced your nature before. I know your heart. You're not coming to shame. The t it's the enemy who kills, steals, and destroys. You're the God who came to bring life and life abundantly. And so I have tasted enough that I, I believe that. Um, I shared this phrase. I think I bungled it last week. A person with an experience is not at the mercy of a person with an argument. So when you encounter, you taste, you actually experience the presence of God, you're no longer at the mercy of somebody who wants to debate you out of that experience or that understanding that you've had. Now you can understand in a greater context how it aligns with the word of God. And if it contradicts that, then of course you need to be open to that. But the reality is, I, I thought about Paul on the road to Damascus and his conversion in Acts 9.4. And the short version, I mean, there's Paul going to persecute the church. And then all of a sudden, a great light shines around him from heaven. And he actually falls down. So for people who have trouble with folks who manifest, the way I, I do sometimes when I sense the presence of God, I sense the anointing of God, my body physically reacts. There are, are times where people are so overcome by the presence of God that an honest, appropriate response is for your strength to drain out of you and to fall to the ground. Because you're actually in your right mind. You're having a, your physical body can barely handle the splendor of a loving, radiant God. And so there's Paul. He falls to the ground, and then he hears these incredible words. I am Jesus. Now, do you think Paul was now at the mercy of his fellow Pharisees, the highly educated people of his time, who wanted to discuss and argue and debate him out of that experience. There was no way in the world anybody with a skilled argument could talk Paul out of what had just happened to him. And that's why they call it Paul's conversion. Because when you taste the genuine relationship, the genuine presence of God, when you have that encounter, something now shifts in your heart. You now have... You see things differently. Your perspective on who God is, on who you are, on who others are. The more genuine that encounter, the more genuine that revelation, the more genuine the conversion, the shifting of what you used to think and value now has begun to shift to the way he thinks and what he values. And you become a different person. I... Uh, when I, I moved up here, I went to a, a church because I was seeking, I was hungry, I had come through some hard times, and uh, I went to Landmark Christian Assembly in Battleground, Washington, and for a year, I could see something in those believers that 
I respected, some things that I kind of longed for, but I didn't want to be a pretend believer, a uh, maybe be believer. I wanted to either n know and really believe, be all the way in, or not be in at all. And so for a year, I sat in the pew. I listened to the word of God being preached. I was p in a worship atmosphere. And to be honest, it was almost torture. It's uncanny that I stayed that long because half of me, every service, was running for the door. I just wanted to get out of there. And the other half of me was wanting to run to the altar to give my life to the Lord. And uh, I would sometimes sweat with beads of conviction. It was so intense. People wouldn't want to sit by me because they could feel the spiritual and emotional turmoil going on. And I won't tell the whole story, but when I finally came to a point, I, the Lord put me out of my mercy and there was an altar call, I went forward and someone led me in a very basic sinner's prayer. And I know that there isn't a, an example necessarily of the sinner's prayer in the Bible, but there's a confession of faith all over the Bible. Um, and so they led me in a simple prayer, and honestly, I left that church with a very bad attitude. I grabbed my stuff up, and it's like, that isn't fair. They made me get saved, and I left. But that night, there was a shift. I had an encounter with the Lord that I was not even fully aware of, where now all of a sudden the word of God was alive to me. It wasn't just reading for intellectual uh, entertainment, but these were the words of God. These, this is, these are the emotions of God expressed to us. And I, uh, all of a sudden prayer was not a letter to Santa. Uh, prayer was a conversation with somebody who was actually there. And then strangely, I had been attracted to believers before, but now there was a connection with believers there was an affection. I, I, they, they actually, they had to ask me, you know, we know that you're just really full of joy right now, but, you know, here we're a little more comfortable if men would hug men and women would hug women. I hadn't even thought of it. I was just like grabbing everybody and just so uh, excited, and it didn't offend me. I was like, I, I understand. I was even doing things out of my basic nature, which are all signs of genuine faith. And so uh, it made me think of, as we're wrapping up, Titus 1.15, that's the book I'm reading through systematically right now, and there's a number of things I want to share with Lori later today that the Lord's uh, provoking in me from that that's very good. But this section ha has always stood out to me. Uh, Titus 1.15 says, To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Until you go through that encounter and you taste that God is good, and now you, you see things differently because you see him for who he really is, then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, we're all created in the image of God. There is the potential for everyone to be able to express the kingdom of God and the ways of God and the presence of Jesus to each other and I can't judge other people for where they're at, but I can purpose with my heart to be a person who carries presence in that way. And as you begin to do that, instead of seeing the dirt in other people's lives, you begin to see the gold. You begin to be willing to serve, to come underneath, to love more unconditionally. There's a, a change that happens inside of you, and it really becomes not, it becomes reality. It's not just a matter of, optimistic thinking it's a shift of perspective because your heart's been changed by that encounter and god's very goodness i heard a, a story once that i think is a great illustration uh, I, I i don't think it's a true story but a husband and wife were standing in their home looking at their window at their neighbors and they had laundry out on a laundry line and the wife was getting kind of frustrated like what is wrong with that lady she doesn't know how to do her laundry her clothes are, you know, they're hanging out there to dry, but the clothes are still filthy. Maybe I should go over then and help show the lady how to use a washing machine or whatever way she's washing clothes, it isn't working. And so that thought went through her mind. And then a day or two later, she and her husband are standing by the same window again, and they're looking out the window, and she's like, this is amazing. Somebody must have talked to her. Her clothes are now sparkling white. Their clothes are clean. I, I guess I don't need to talk with her. What, I wonder what happened. And the husband said, well, actually, I just cleaned the window. The clothes were clean all along, but because of the perspective of seeing it through dirt, she could only see the dirt. 
people who have the perspective of God's goodness is there for them, all of a sudden they start looking for that goodness through that cleaned heart, through that clean window of their soul. Now they can see the potential for righteousness, for joy, for goodness, even in other people's lives. Ho! Oh, Lord, let my conversion be like that, where I see other people through your eyes, and I see a life that's worth sacrificing for and to serve and to build up. So I, I want to end on uh, Titus uh, 4 3. I told you it's the book I'm reading right now. And by the way, I'm working through Judges too. And that's, if you haven't read that for a while, Judges is, is a crazy book. It's so good. It's so many of the stories that are the, uh, the pictures of who uh, God is and the way he expresses himself. And then the New Testament really are the uh, captions for the, the Bible stories that are in the Old Testament. And so I'm, I'm getting a lot out of it. But Titus 3, 4 through 7 says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out richly oh, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is talking about the gospel. This is talking about someone having an encounter with the goodness and the loving kindness of God and getting transformed, converted, saved, by that encounter and they didn't deserve it because of their own acts of righteousness it was because of god's mercy but he washes he regenerates he renews us by his spirit and he is poured out on us richly through jesus so that being justified by his grace we might become heirs we might apprehend everything he has for us so how i want to wrap up today is a little bit different um, I just want to close in an opportunity and a prayer for you all. Um, having many guests that maybe have never been in this building, maybe this is the first time you've heard of really the difference between knowing God through behavior, through rules, uh, and not really knowing that encounter, not knowing that relationship. And so if you're not looking forward to Jesus coming because you know you're not right with him, then take that first step of receiving the gospel itself, that Jesus has appeared to show us the very loving, radiant heart of the Father that is calling you. And he made it possible by his life for you to step into that relationship. So if you are part of the church and you're looking forward to his coming, continue to purify yourself in that expectant hope. But if you don't think you're part of that church, I just want to offer like someone did with me, to lead you in a very simple sinner's prayer. And you may feel something and you may not. Um, I didn't particularly, but man, it took. And so I don't want to miss an opportunity. If somebody here today is hearing a message like this for maybe the first time, believers, I encourage you right now to pray. And I'm just going to encourage you, if you want to know that you can look forward to Jesus' return, that it's going to be a good day and not a bad day. It's going to be a day of a reception and a, a welcoming and not a day where you're going to be afraid of your sin being revealed, then just join me in this quick prayer and we're just going to acknowledge uh, that Jesus made it possible for you to be reconciled and paid the price for your sin. So Father, today, I thank you, Father, for your love, that you've loved me from the day I was born. You knew me before the foundations of the world were created. You had a purpose and a plan specifically for me. And because you are good, it's a good plan. But Father, I know my sin has separated me from you. You never separated from me. You never turned your back on me. But I turned my back on you by not loving people the way that I am able to. And so I ask for your forgiveness for those ways, God, that I have not operated out of love. And I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to forgive all of those sins now. It's my only hope. I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. It's by your grace, through
through faith in what Jesus did for me that I now uh, receive him as my Lord and Savior. And Lord, I thank you that by this simple act, oh, you now are calling me a son or a daughter. I'm a child of yours. And I am making this commitment, Lord, to walk with Jesus, to be in his word, to be a person of prayer, but more than anything, to be like him when he appears, that I want to be part of what you're doing on the earth. I want heaven on earth for my friends and my family. Jesus, I want you resting upon my life, not just residing in me, but resting upon me and transforming others through me. And I thank you for hearing this prayer. I thank you for responding right now. And Lord, I personally thank you for everyone who expressed a new level of faith, a new level of commitment, in their relationship with you, Jesus. We celebrate, God, what you have done today. Help us continue to just press into your presence and be those who look at this world differently because we have tasted and we have seen how good you truly are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.